I've got a bone to pick with the MBTI personality matrix. I think they were onto something with the 16 categories of people, but the way those people are characterized is completely backwards. Personality, after all, is extremely contextual and fluid. People act differently in response to different situations and different types of people. I ask you, what exactly is an introverted person? Is it someone who doesn't like to be around other people? Or is it someone who struggles to find people that they like to be around because there are so few that they can connect with? Maybe I don't like being around my friends, or maybe I don't have the right friends. Either way, introversion is a behavioral symptom, not a cause. Far more important to understanding why people act the way they do is to understand why they think the way they think. And that's where my neurotyping chart comes in. Not unlike MBTI, I've broken down human neurotypes into 16 categories, which I'll be classifying about 100 anime characters into in the course of this video. Mine is much easier to classify yourself with. You don't need any kind of quiz or anything. Just think about the way you think and find your place along these two axes. Linearity and lexicality. Linearity refers to how linear the thoughts in your head are. An extremely linear thinker only has a single train of thought at a given time and communicates in very straightforward ways, while a nonlinear or lateral thinker will have multiple trains of thought at any given time and tend to communicate in more jumbled or indirect ways. Lexicality refers to how much a person's understanding depends on the ability to codify ideas using specific language. A lexical thinker will only understand things which can be put into words, refusing to acknowledge understandings which haven't been codified. Non-lexical or impressionistic thinkers, on the other hand, might understand things but struggle to put them into words and find other methods of communication preferable. Linearity and lexicality can be used to describe types of thinking, but not necessarily how good someone is at thinking. So I'll also be noting the estimated IQs of the characters I talk about so that we can see how these types of thinking manifest at different IQ levels. I also want to emphasize that this is a chart for describing ways of thinking, not personalities, which are affected by other factors such as temperament or environment. There will be cases in which people who think very similarly can nonetheless manifest very different personalities. On my Neuro cards, which I'll be showing on screen throughout the video, I've estimated each character's IQ and rated their temperament as either relaxed, neutral, or intense. For IQ, I judged characters on their problem-solving abilities and ability to react quickly in a variety of different situations. For temperament, I judged the character's general level of emotional response to provocations. A relaxed person will be very difficult to get a reaction out of, whereas an intense person will have an immediate outward response. We'll be exploring the neurotyping chart in columns, starting on the left with the most lexical thinkers and moving from the most linear to least linear categories within that column before moving on to the next column and so on. Category 1, Middle Managers. Very linear, very lexical. Very linear, very lexical thinkers are the classic idea of the type A anal retentive personality. These people have little patience for nonsense because they need their time just to process the rules which are already in place. And they are obsessed with rules, whether those be the laws of the land or their own conception of the rules of nature. To one of these people, a word which doesn't fit its definition to the letter is an inappropriate word, and anyone using or spelling words wrongly comes off as dumb. Thanks to their very strict view of what is correct and incorrect, these characters tend to find themselves in arguments with less precise communicators often. Middle managers with more relaxed attitudes will likely just blow off and ignore much of what they see as the nonsense coming out of the mouths of their less lexical friends. Lexical thinkers have a tendency to assume positions of authority because of their ability to identify and enforce the rules of a system to the letter. However, being on the far end of the lexical spectrum, these people have difficulty understanding and communicating with more impressionistic people, which can make it difficult for them to take up leadership positions that require them to communicate with those people. The spirit of the law is often difficult to capture in its letters, after all, which is why a lot of legal language is written to be deliberately and intricately vague. This is why linear thinking, hyperlexical thinkers tend to be better at enforcing rules than they are at making or understanding rules, hence my titling them as middle managers. 
For one of these people, the biggest threats to their happiness are getting trapped in a system that takes advantage of them and their difficulty in communicating with less lexical thinkers. Linear thinkers tend to have a powerful sense of self, since at any given time they define themselves in that moment by their singular ongoing chain of thought, whereas more lateral thinkers may struggle to place themselves within the current moment, instead viewing themselves in terms of behavioral trends or life arcs. But we'll talk more about lateral thinkers when we get to their sections. In order to get the best understanding of how these neurotypes manifest themselves in anime, I find it most helpful to start by highlighting the characters with the highest and lowest IQs in each category, as they show us the extremes of how these neurotypes affect a person's life. Our high IQ characters will be the patron saints of their respective categories, while the lower IQ characters will be the working hards. The patron saint of middle management would be Tsunemori Akane from Psychopaths. Top of her class and given the highest recommendation for every possible job in government by the government, Akane was pretty much written specifically to be the ultimate type A personality. It could be argued that her arc over the course of the show is basically just her struggle to understand the conception nearly everyone else she encounters has that the letters of this world's laws are fundamentally flawed. And in the end, she comes to the conclusion that the spirit of the law, while yet intangible, is something fundamentally different from the current letter of the law, and that she will from now on consider herself loyal to the letters of her own codification of that law. Now, of course, no one's ever been working hard like Achan from Baby Steps. Right from the start, we are introduced to Achan as someone who has reached the top of his class in spite of the fact that absolutely nothing about learning comes easy to him, purely because he will just constantly study a subject until he's finally able to grasp it. With his neurotype and work ethic, there's no question that Achan would have easily found work in any kind of middle management position, which the Japanese education system basically exists for the sole purpose of filing people into. However, to the shock of literally everyone, Achan, who is so unfit that he can't even jog short distances, develops an interest in tennis. And as soon as his coach is able to show him that tennis is a game which can be played hyperlexically, he becomes totally enthralled with it. If Achan had a more lateral mind, he'd be able to interpret a lot more of the sensory data which he takes in while playing a match during the course of play. But because he's such a linear thinker, it takes all of his concentration just to be able to react in the heat of the moment. Only after poring over what he saw in extensive detail can Achan get a firm grasp on what just happened and start trying to compare it against previous notes. But because he has to be able to do at least some of this on the fly in order to make adjustments to his play over the course of a match, he goes straight to his notebook after every play, draws out the trajectories of every pass, and takes as many notes as he can before he has to go back. Achan shows us how even someone with a low IQ can find a way to engage with something which might initially seem totally out of their lane, and that they can potentially advance and find happiness or success even if it takes a lot more work than it would for smarter or better fit people. Another lower IQ character in this category is Utena Tenjo. Utena's personal code of ethics differs from that of the society surrounding her in certain ways, but she very much holds herself and those around her to that code, even though her relative ignorance makes her easy to manipulate by smarter thinkers of all categories. Middle managers with average IQ are extremely common in anime, most often as somewhat stereotypical nagging girlfriends. The nagging girlfriend archetype in any culture essentially represents that culture's platonic ideals. It's a person who demands that the main character, who is usually neurally unfit to fulfill that society's ideals, become more like those ideals. Since Japanese society is very lexically driven, characters like Yoko from Gurren Lagann, Kagome from Inuyasha, Steph from No Game No Life, Winry from Full Metal Alchemist, Kaname from Full Metal Panic, Misty from Pokemon, and of course Chiri from Sayonara Zetsubo Sensei are all highly critical of risky behavior, annoyed by egotism, and of course in love with their man's mysterious, unplaceable charisma for a reason that's always out of grasp. If you put this character type into a group of girls, they fulfill a similar straight man role, as in the cases of Mio from k or Kagami from Lucky Star. Guys with personalities like this will have their friends asking, what are you, my wife, all the time. Jet Black from Cowboy Bebop is probably the only guy structured enough to keep a hold on Spike. Shinpachi tries his damnedest to do the same for the crew in Gintama, but he's trounced by the fact that his companions are just more intelligent. 
Rosiu's dedication to Data nearly led him to shoving humanity back underground in Gurren Lagann, but luckily, Risk Takers prevailed. Some higher IQ characters in this category would be the likes of Nodoka from Kaon or Lawrence from Spice and Wolf, who tend to be lacking in imagination on their own, but are smart enough to recognize when someone else's less lexical abilities might be useful. Category 2, Brooders. Fairly linear, very lexical. While similar for the most part and kind of hard to distinguish from the previous category, especially when we're talking about anime characters who tend to be presented with more extreme personalities, the distinguishing factor of a less linear thinker would be their ability to step outside of themselves, granted to them by the increase in number of simultaneous trains of thought. People in this category make for good doctors, lawyers, and killers because of the increased distance they can put between themselves and their actions or the consequences thereof while still functioning in highly lexical contexts. The patron saint of brooders is undoubtedly Light Yagami from Death Note. While the distance he puts between himself and his actions eventually allows him to stomach his own sickening power, once he's convinced himself that the letter of his law is the right one, nothing can stop him from putting the world into his version of order. Spending so much time embodying this separate conception of himself which he develops to fulfill his godly role eventually causes that version of his personality to become his real one, as more lateral thinkers continue finding their way towards boxing him in. The brooder who's working the hardest is good ol' Mob from Mob Psycho 100. Not unlike Achan, Mob tasks himself with a physical challenge outside of his wheelhouse, although since he lacks a coach who can easily help him to understand how to make progress with his exercise, it remains a slow and difficult slog. While Mob is like Utena in that his adherence to what he sees as the rules makes him easy to manipulate by anyone creative enough to make up the rules for him, he is somewhat more mysterious in that he seemingly internally has doubts about the things others tell him, but goes along with them anyways, and learning to listen to that doubtful, more honest side of himself and bring it to the forefront is a major part of his arc. I think Kiki from Kiki's Delivery Service is a similar, possibly somewhat more intelligent character, though it's hard to say since she's even younger. The reason I call these characters brooders is that whereas their chain of thought is very lexical, their ability to think multiple things at the same time means that their outward and inward personalities can differ from one another, and as such they tend to do more of their thinking on the inside and to verbalize only their conclusions. You'll be more likely to hear these characters speaking often if they are more intelligent and able to come to conclusions quickly. Some quieter characters of this type are the likes of Hiei from Yu Yu Hakusho, Kiritsugu from Fate Zero, Jean from Samurai Champloo, and Sasuke from Naruto. While these characters often have just as many contentions with the seemingly illogical statements of the people around them as middle managers do, they are more likely to keep those feelings internal until confronted. More talkative characters of this type include Nami from One Piece, Ryuk from Death Note, and Arima from Karikano. These characters are almost just as self-assured as their more linear counterparts in the middle management category, but again, their ability to step back from themselves gives them a chance to be a bit more self-aware and to humor perspectives outside of their own under the supposition that they put their own standpoint on hold for a moment. Category 3. Technicians. Fairly lateral, very lexical. Technicians are one of the more common types of characters found in anime, likely because many fans and creators of anime fall into this category. Technicians are usually thinking about a few unrelated things at once, but they still very clearly understand those things in lexical terms, which makes them great for jobs that involve keeping track of huge amounts of data in service of developing a greater whole, such as coding, accounting, and even most styles of animating, given it requires drawing the same thing over and over with slight variations while keeping track of how they affect the whole of the cut. Anime's patron saint technician is Makise Kurisu from Steins Gate. Her high IQ and fairly lateral thinking make her able to understand new concepts extremely fast, as long as there is a clear lexical justification for those ideas. Not unlike the bossy middle managers we talked about before, the most difficult thing for her to deal with is the nonsense logic of a less lexical, lower IQ, and even more lateral thinker like Okabe, but we'll get to him later. Tosaka Rin from Fate Stay Night is kind of the same type of thinker, but for magic. I wasn't able to find a popular anime character that I knew well enough to put in the lower IQ section of this category, but if I had to name a technician who's most certainly working hard, it would be Kobayashi from Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid. 
Kobayashi is one of the most realistic and eminently relatable anime characters around, and I have to imagine that her day-to-day -day life and way of thinking is about as accurate to the real-life experience of the average technician as anime has ever gotten. Similarly, Kugiyama from Genji Ken would most likely fall into this category. Technicians fill a lot of interesting roles in anime thanks to the vast array of situations they see themselves applied to. Ginko from Mushishi is essentially a traveling technician solving problems with nature spirits. Rimuru from Tensura uses his technological prowess to fix monster society in the world that he gets isekai'd to. Ritsuko from Evangelion and Liron from Gurren Lagann need their lateral thinking abilities just to keep up with the data outputs and repairs for all the giant robots they have to oversee, as do many other anime scientists, while Blackjack is sort of the ultimate doctor thanks to his lateral mind. Kilua from Hunter x Hunter is a sort of murder technician. For examples of characters like this who haven't graduated high school yet, look no further than Hanekawa from the Monogatari series and Mei from Manabi Strait. It is worth noting that because lateral thinkers have somewhat faster and more chaotic minds than the average person, they can preoccupy themselves with their own thoughts and interests more easily than linear thinkers, and will more quickly become disinterested or bored with things that don't interest them. If they don't have the IQ to recognize this behavior in themselves and mask or take advantage of it, then there's a decent chance that they may be diagnosed with developmental disorders such as ADHD, Asperger's, or autism. Category 4. Human Calculators. Very lateral, very lexical. The more data which a human mind can process at once, and the more lexically it understands that data, the closer it comes to functioning like a human calculator. A more lateral view of the world tends to be much more complex than a linear one, and a more lexical view tends to be much more specific, meaning that these people consider the world to operate under a very complex and particular set of rules which they are very serious about following. Human calculators, like any hyperlateral thinkers, are recognizably autistic to just about anyone regardless of their IQ. As someone's worldview becomes increasingly specific and alienating thanks to the breadth of their perspective, they are harder and harder for anyone else to relate to. The more autistic someone is, the less likely others are to be able to parse the specifics of their worldview, and may at best be able to grasp the broad strokes of their perspective. The patron saint of human calculators is L from Death Note. This guy is constantly loading his brain with an endless stream of raw data and pumping out calculations like it's nobody's business. Yet he's so particular about following the letter of the law that even when Light is basically the only suspect on the face of the planet, L still feels the need to prove his actions beyond a shadow of a doubt before doing something about him. This in spite of the fact that from anyone else's perspective, L would seem to be breaking every rule that exists in polite society. But from L's perspective, he is doing everything in the way that he has deemed most optimal. It is very rare that these characters are portrayed in anime as anything less than super geniuses, but thankfully there's one boy working hard enough to give us an idea of how this idea would manifest at a lower IQ in the form of Sosuke Sagara from Full Metal Panic. This guy's hyperlateral thinking allows him to make quick decisions and protect his ass on the battlefield, where knowing the most logical decision to make in a given situation will usually prevail. However, his hyper-specific understanding of how to survive in the world has little application in the daily life of a Japanese high schooler. And because Sosuke is an idiot, his attempts to identify the best course of action in situations he doesn't understand leads to taking the wrong actions constantly. Mostly, though, I could say all the same things about the rest of these characters that I did about L. Shiro from No Game No Life, Smile from Ping Pong, and Yuki Nagato from The Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya are all unintentionally eccentric geniuses who can run through countless possibilities in their head at mock speed and choose just right conclusions based on their understanding, which will only be skewed in situations where less lexical interpretations of inputs were necessary for understanding. And with that, we've made our way to the end of the first column. It's interesting to think about the kinds of shows which more lexical thinkers tend to appear in. Human calculators and middle managers are both pretty easy tropes to create characters with, but they are rarely presented with the nuance that someone who actually thinks like one of those characters would present themselves with, given that any neurotype at the corners of this chart is just far enough outside the bell curve to be somewhat unusual. Technicians are plentiful within the medium, likely as they are very relatable characters to many anime creators, while brooders are comparably somewhat rare and harder to pin down. 
If I had to pick a single show which I think best represents the middle management mode of thought, it would be Baby Steps, for the reasons I described previously. While Inuyasha is one of the few action-oriented fantasy shows to feature a character like that as the female protagonist. For Brooders, Death Note is obviously iconic, as is Mob Psycho for reasons previously described. And I think it'd do you good to check out Karaikano as well, especially if your home life is troubled at all. Technicians will probably love sprawling adventure shows with clearly defined rules and narrative arcs, like Full Metal Alchemist, Hunter x Hunter, and One Piece, and relax with relatable fare, like Dragon Maid, Genshiken, and Mushishi. Or, if they want whiplash between both of those feelings, they can check out Stein's Gate and Tensura. For a human calculator, it can be absolutely nothing less than Legend of the Galactic Heroes, as complex and yet without lexical flaw as anime has ever been. Also, any massively complex franchise is a pretty good bet for anyone on the more lateral side of the spectrum, but after all, it is the goal of most medium to have some level of full-spectrum appeal. Your neurotype is not going to completely determine what you do or don't like if the media is somewhat complex, but there is definitely media that skews more towards certain neurotypes. If you feel like you relate to one of the characters we've talked about so far, and you're wondering if you can find any anime YouTubers that might satisfy your type of thinking, then I have some suggestions. If you're a living calculator, check out Pause and Select, Econ, Rika Fag, or The Pedantic Romantic. For technicians, you'll be looking for Best Guy Ever or The Canapa Effect. Brooders, I don't have a lot for you, but maybe check out my old buddy Bakaraptor. And Middle Managers, I'm sorry, but if there's an anime YouTuber who is perfect for you, then I don't know about them because, frankly, y'all are the least relatable people in the world to me. With that out of the way, let's move on to the next column and talk about less lexical thinkers. Category 5. Reasonable People. Very linear, fairly lexical. While linear thinkers are usually very straightforward in their communication, that doesn't mean that they can only ever communicate things through words. In fact, I would argue that the human brain was fundamentally designed to be able to understand things without the use of language. Lexical thinkers aren't incapable of harboring impressions somewhere within their minds, but those impressions lack any concrete sense of meaning to them until they are able to be codified somehow. Reasonable people, on the other hand, while still mostly relying on language to communicate, are more capable of listening to their gut and considering the validity of ideas which they have yet to fully codify, even if they may continue working towards codification. While it's hard to find a character like this with an especially high IQ, there's no doubt that the category's patron saint is Saitama from One Punch Man. Compared to the extreme personality surrounding him, he is almost serenely placid and perfectly reasonable towards most circumstances and people. You could even say it's like his superpower, besides being One Punch Man. Whereas middle managers almost never get to be the stars of action-adventure series, reasonable people are fairly popular as older teen protagonists in shonen manga, and none is working hard like Yusuke Urameshi, who's just a regular reasonable guy constantly beset by the unreasonability of the world around him, and since he lacks the intelligence to deal with things rationally, he spends a lot of time pissed off, confused, and flailing in the dark. But after years of learning, training, and taking responsibility, he becomes a big damn reasonable hero. Similar things could be said of Ichigo from Bleach, Chihiro from Spirited Away, or even Hikaru from Macross. These characters can play great supporting roles to less reasonable or more lateral characters as well, as do Zoro from One Piece, Naotsugu from Log Horizon, Jigen from Lupin the Third, and Azusa from Kaon. In Genshiken, part of the joke is that Saki Kasukabe is this type of person, but is made to seem unreasonable from the perspective of the unreasonable people surrounding her. Category 6 Caretakers. Fairly linear, fairly lexical. The four categories in the center of the chart are inevitably some of the rarer ones to find in anime simply because it is almost required to employ some nuance in their characterization to keep them from coming off as more fringe personalities. When I first created this category and called it Caretakers, I initially second-guessed the classification, thinking it too specific, and yet every anime character I could find who fit this category could also perfectly be described by the word Caretaker in some sense, which either means that it's the only context anime has found to employ this neurotype, or that people of this neurotype are just intrinsically predisposed to caretaking roles. Considering their placement on the chart, it kind of makes perfect sense, because they're in the best position out of any neurotype to be able to understand people of the largest different number of other neurotypes, and to help organize and codify those people's ideas. 
They can step outside of themselves thanks to their more lateral thinking, and they are understanding of more impressionistic ideas because they aren't purely lexical thinkers themselves. Yet their relative linearity and lexicality makes their minds a lot more organized than less linear or less lexical thinkers. The patron saint of caretakers is Misato Katsuragi from Neon Genesis Evangelion. Her relatively lateral thinking gives her an advantage in action scenarios not only because she can keep track of multiple things and solve problems quickly, but also because she can parse some of the more lateral ideas proposed by the scientists and analysts surrounding her. She also has some complex, non-lexical feelings that she very much doesn't want to talk about, and as such she can be empathetic towards the extremely impressionistic attitudes of the young people surrounding her. In the end, she ends up playing dead mother to basically everyone. While I wouldn't consider him to have a below-average IQ, Takasu Ryuji from Toradora is most definitely working hard. His thinking is neither nearly as lateral nor impressionistic as Taiga's, but it's just enough of both that he empathizes with her easily and doesn't take too long to fully understand her, and then of course to find himself taking care of her. Depending on their temperament, caretakers can range from gentle-hearted but stern-willed characters like Fate from Nanoha, Haru from Beastars, Asuna from Sword Art Online, Brock from Pokemon, and Shiryuki Hime, to more sarcastic, begrudging caretakers such as Kion from Haruhi, or any of the main guys in Air, Clannad, or Canon. Category 7. Quick-Witted Fairly lateral and fairly lexical. While you may think that being in one of the central squares would mean that quick-witted people have just as easy a time getting along with others as caretakers, this isn't necessarily the case, as more lateral thinkers will inevitably come to have much more specific and complex worldviews than more straightforward thinkers. While they still do have more of an ability to understand and communicate with people across a larger chunk of the chart than most hyperlexical thinkers do, it is likely that the perceived cleverness of these quick-witted types will be relative to their audience. Holo from Spice of Wolf is of course the patron saint of witty characters. Whereas hyperlexical characters have more of a tendency to focus on the exact meaning of words, those with a more impressionistic view of language will tend to view it as something to be toyed with and to deliberately navigate the gaps in its ability to communicate. Holo uses her more lateral and less lexical take on language to tease and entertain her friend Lawrence, whom we've previously identified as a high IQ middle manager. Quick-witted characters occupy a range of personalities, on account of this likely being another category into which a lot of anime fans and staff would themselves be placed, given it's only a small step to the right of technicians, and that being an animator means being a technician in a medium which is essentially non-lexical by nature. For a more realistic take on a high-intellect person of this neurotype, look to Yukino from Karekano as a main character, or Kensuke from Evangelion as a support. A more realistic and incredibly unfortunate low IQ example is of course the infamous Tomoko from Watamote, who's working hard in her own way. I was tempted to put Kirito into the low IQ section of this category, but I think Reki Kawahara was trying to write him as a high IQ technician and failed because he himself is a low IQ fast thinking author which is why I tried to stick with well-realized characters for most of this chart. Ryugamine from Dura Dada and Watashi from Humanity Has Declined are more intelligent characters in this archetype with a lot of interesting outlooks on the society around them. While I'd argue Lupin III is perhaps even more over-the-top intelligent than Holo as a character in this category, though I didn't want to pick him as the patron saint simply because Holo's show is almost dedicated to communication. To put it another way, conversation is a game which Lupin loves to play to win. So does Faye Valentine from Cowboy Bebop while I'm at it, whereas Holo plays just for fun. You could probably say the same about Shinobu from Monogatari, but she's a bit more blasé towards conversation as compared to Holo. Sometimes the witty life can be a struggle too. Simon the Driller started pretending to be a purely lexical thinker after an earthquake killed his parents and scared him straight, but the outlandishly impressionistic Kamina brought that part of him back to the surface and put him into this category. Handakun from Barakamon deals with trying to navigate the narrow space between lexicality and impressionism wherein resides calligraphy, as someone for whom coming to terms with the inability to codify his abstract feelings is part of his arc. I don't want to go on about this category all day, so I'll just list out a few more that I found. Reigen from Mob Psycho, Otoko from Galko-chan, Tanaka from Genshiken, and Sai from Hitamari Sketch. Category 8. Analysts. Very lateral and fairly lexical. Not unlike quick-witted, analysts are common in anime because it's a common neurotype of anime creators and fans. 
While a lot of these people may feel like human calculators with the sheer amount of information constantly bouncing around in their heads, most people aren't quite as hyperlexical as the people we talked about in the previous column, especially if they are, again, interested in an inherently somewhat non-lexical medium. It is precisely that slight impressionistic slant which creates the analyst, out of their desire to attempt to codify that feeling as lexically as possible to get the best understanding they can. While a living calculator is unlikely to trifle itself with considering yet unproven possibilities, analysts will gain a sense of something before they have the ability to codify it, and then work towards the ability to do so. Picking a patron saint of analysis is difficult, as there are multiple high IQ characters deserving of the title, but I'm going to have to hand it to Sora from No Game No Life, as I think he represents the clearest conception of the archetype. Sora is extremely intelligent and wealthy with technical knowledge, only slightly less so than his adoptive sister, the living computer Shiro, even being seven years her senior. But what he's got on her is imagination. Sora figures out what he needs to do and does it often as soon as he's finished understanding it and before he's found enough words to describe his reasoning, which once he does, he will do in extensive depth. All it really takes is the understanding that impressionistic ideas exist to begin taking a lexical approach towards deconstructing impressionistic understandings, affording the analyst much more capability in translating impressionist ideas in ways that even a living computer might be able to understand, while still understanding that there will never be enough words to communicate anything accurately. Their ability to get at least a loose lexical grasp on the impressionistic reasoning of the people around them makes them excellent leaders and tacticians, as well as extremely dangerous manipulators. On a sliding scale of innocent to evil high Q analysts, I'd put Senku from Dr. Stone, Shirue from Log Horizon, Lelouch from Code Geass, and Shinra from Durarara. But of course, not everyone who tries to do analysis is necessarily good at it, and anime loves to make fun of these characters for thinking they've decoded the universe when they're actually spewing a bunch of nonsense. The perfect mid-IQ analyst, of course, is Okarin from Steins Gate. In dramatic, ironic fashion, a lot of Okarin's manic ravings do turn out to be correct. It's clear that his impressionistic idea of what's going on in the world isn't unfounded, but his ability to explain it is lacking thanks to his substandard scientific knowledge. Haruko from Fulikuli is similarly rambunctious and seems to think she has all the answers, having an easy time manipulating a naive child like Naota, but in the end she underestimates Naota and is undone by her loose and somewhat idiotic approach to her goals. In more realistic contexts, these characters are most often obsessive otaku with a propensity for dispensing long-winded analytical diatribes. Madarame from Genshiken is the realist take on this type, while Konata from Lucky Star mercifully moefies it. Kema from The World God Only Knows and Erika from Durarara are somewhere in between. Araragi from Monogatari is less of an out-and-out -out otaku but thinks exactly like one. Itoshiki from Sayonara Zetsubo Sensei would probably never admit he was an otaku, and by the way, Hiroshi Kamiya voices like half of these characters. Low IQ analysts aren't that common, but if anyone out there is working hard, it would be Naofumi from Rising of the Shield Hero, who finds himself at odds with the society on the whole, and is constantly running through an angry, disorganized analysis in his mind of how much of a piece of shit everyone is. So now that we've reached the end of this column, which anime would I consider representative of somewhat lexical thought? I think reasonable people will probably enjoy some of the shonen with older protagonists like Yu Yu Hakusho, Bleach, or One Punch Man, as fairly straightforward and aesthetically cool shows. Caretakers will find a lot to relate to in a heavy way with Beastars, and a lighter way with Toradora, while enjoying lighter fare like Shiryuki Hime, or especially if you're a somewhat sarcastic guy, any of the early Kyoto animation shows. Quick-witted viewers might enjoy stuff like Spice and Wolf, Crest of the Stars, Kare Kano, Durarara, Humanity Has Declined, Konosuba, Cromarty High School, or basically anything really. I mean, anime is largely made for people in these lateral mid-categories. If you're an analyst, just open up my anime list and watch everything I've given a 10 out of 10. For reasonable people, I would recommend Hero for your anime recommendations. Caretakers would probably appreciate Super Eyepatch Wolf and Keiko Cat. Quick-witted people might appreciate core, and really most anime analysis channels, and of course, if you consider yourself to be an analyst, then you probably feel like most anime analysis videos just state conclusions you've already come to, or would have if you watched the same thing. There's only one place where you can come for analysis of analysis itself, and that place is right here on the Digibro channel. Now, it's time for us to finally cross over to the impressionistic side of the chart. Category 9, Clear-Sighted. 
very linear, fairly impressionist. Impressionistic understanding is often referred to as emotional or nonverbal understanding, including in this video for the sake of variety and ease of understanding, but neither of those is quite accurate. Lexical thinking does not mean thinking in words, per se, but thinking with lexemes, i.e. the units of a lexicon. You may have heard analysts refer to the idea of a visual lexicon before, referring to images which become lexemes within the visual language of a medium, which are then repeated by an artist or by other artists. Even a computer could technically create an original image by calculating visual possibilities on the basis of analyzing images in terms of lexemes. However, a computer can never create a new lexeme from whole cloth. It can only identify those which have been analyzed. The human mind is often compared to a computer, and it's possible that impressionistic thought is technically created through esoteric arrangements of unidentified lexemes. But we have yet to find a way to program a computer to do this automatically at a level which even approaches what the human mind is capable of impressionistically. Extending this computer metaphor, one could think of the laterality of thought as being similar to a computer's random access memory. However, whereas a computer has to be commanded to use its RAM, a human has to make an extreme concerted effort through meditation to shut it off. Likewise, while you can give a computer a set of broad parameters within which it can randomize lexemes to create technically original work, an impressionistic thinker just simply does think in this seemingly non-lexical way at all times. Like, imagine if when they coded the Brave browser, the computer had then just created the logo for it entirely on its own based on the impression that it got from the code. That would be impressionistic thinking. But this doesn't mean that impressionism has to manifest itself as art. It can be manifested physically, emotionally, and even lingually just as easily, and we'll see characters who manifest their impressionist thoughts in many different ways as we proceed. A fairly impressionist but linear thinker will still communicate largely through words, but be much more likely to use imprecise and impressionistic language or even sound effects and nonverbal expressions in conversation. Because these kinds of people tend to live in the moment, they don't likely have the patience for art, and will more likely prefer to express themselves physically through activities like sports or adventure. Like with previous linear categories, it's somewhat difficult to identify high IQ characters, as the lack of lateral thought kind of limits the speed at which these characters can think. But the patron saint I've chosen for this category is Mikuru from The Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya. We learn from early on that Mikuru is a straight-A student and clearly intelligent, but because she doesn't know how to put up cogent arguments against the situations she gets thrust into, she has a tendency to simply go along with them and express her discomfort in unacknowledged expressions by the autistic Haruhi. When we meet the future version of Mikuru, she seems to have gotten much more comfortable with speaking and is able to explain things clearly and confidently in a way that she probably could have all along had she just had more faith in her own intelligence. By far the majority of clear-sighted characters, though, are working hard as hell, because linear and impressionistic characters with low IQ are pretty much the bread and butter of the shonen action-adventure genre. Naruto is going to be my pick for the hardest worker of them all. He's not quite as abstract as the characters we're going to be talking about in the last column, but he's definitely the type who understands things on the emotional level first and foremost, while being a general, complete, and utter moron about everything else. Which is fine, because he's in good company with Ash from Pokemon, Renton from Eureka 7, and Inuyasha himself. In shows where the main character falls into a more reasonable role, you can bet that a clear-sighted guy is going to be somewhere stalking in their supporting cast, be it Kuwabara from Yu Yu Hakusho, Taiju from Dr. Stone, or in a rare low-IQ female portrayal of this role, Kallen from Code Geass. That isn't to say that there aren't plenty of girls on this side of the chart, of course. After all, women are typically seen as being more commonly impressionistic in thought than men. Actually, I think it's fair to say that the ability for a woman to think impressionistically and still be intelligent is far more commonly suggested than a man's ability to do the same. When a man has more impressionistic tendencies, it tends to be blamed on his lack of intelligence, even if he ends up being the one who solves everyone's problems and saves the day in the end. It's obvious that the authors of stories like that are trying to say that this more impressionistic form of thought has value. 
But because the universes of some of those stories, like Naruto, are themselves impressionistic in turn, the message is likely to be lost on more lexical thinkers who would need to see the character proving the worth of impressionistic thought in a lexically coherent setting. Thankfully, shows about clear-sighted girls don't seem to have the same insecurities as those about boys. Madoka Magica, Lyrical Nanoha, and Cardcaptor Sakura all tend to feel very strongly for the people around them and dedicate the whole of themselves to helping others in the heat of the moment. A few male characters who do come off similarly are Ippo from Hajime no Ippo, Alphonse from Fullmetal Alchemist, or Ashitaka from Princess Mononoke. Alongside them, I'd put the likes of Kanbaru Suruga from Monogatari, who probably isn't necessarily meant to come off as intelligent as Nisi Oisin can't help making her sound, and the also Miyuki Sawashiro voiced Selty from Dura Da Da. Saber from Fate Stay Night, Akane from Ranma One Half, and Darkness from Konosuba would all fall under this category as well. Category 10 Room Brighteners. Fairly linear, fairly impressionist. Room brighteners fulfill a similar role to caretakers for the same reason of being very close to the highest number of different neurotypes. But whereas caretakers tend to be focused on providing care for others in a more logistical sense, room brighteners, as the name implies, have a tendency to bring emotional nourishment to the people around them through their own self-expression. This isn't to say that all of these people will brighten everyone's day all of the time, but their presence tends to comfort people in all of the more linear and at-all impressionist categories by creating an atmosphere in which it is clear that you will not be judged for your ability to portray yourself lexically. Because these people have more than a singular train of thought, they are capable of developing front-facing personas that they don't have to intellectually embody in the same way that linear thinkers do, allowing them to craft those personas. And whereas lexical thinkers will craft these personas around systems of logic, impressionists will craft them around systems of aesthetic. My patron saint of room brighteners is Nyanta from Log Horizon. Nyanta is an older gentleman, a hardcore role-playing furry that says Nya at the end of his sentences, and acts like a swashbuckling knight of some denomination. He is intelligent and wise, patient and considerate, understanding, and highly capable of communicating even with more lexical thinkers through carefully worded metaphor. His presence is a comfort to others because you'll never feel like you have to put on airs around a guy who talks and acts like a cat, no matter how sagely the stuff he says. It's no surprise that the caretaker Serra admires him so much. Porco Rosso has a similar presence to Nyanta, even if his disarming appearance wasn't crafted as a matter of choice. A room brightener has a lot more opportunity to succeed even with relatively low intelligence than other categories because people are generally drawn to their presence, which is why I nearly titled this category Pop Stars. And after all, Min Mei from Macross keeps working hard at her family's restaurant even after becoming a famous pop idol aboard the Macross. Minmei has her own kind of wisdom in places, so I wouldn't go so far as to call her a total fucking moron, but she certainly knows how to act like one. But it's not like everyone who's born to be a pop star necessarily gets the opportunity. Dororo is without a doubt a delightful personality, but as an orphan child in feudal Japan, their gift of gab isn't good for much more than trying to sweet talk people. Fu from Samurai Champloo is older, cuter, and further in the future, so she fares a little bit better. Galko-chan has this effect on people, but her particular choice of aesthetic also leads to a lot of misunderstandings. Ayame from Shimonetta would be an absolute blast if she wasn't trapped in a society in which the concept of dirty jokes doesn't exist, thanks to regulation. Kazuma from Konosuba is definitely this kind of person, but because he's such a bastard, no one wants to admit how much they love him. But everyone does. Not all of these thinkers are as self-assured or outwardly expressive as those, though. Characters like Mayui from Monogatari, Tsukasa from Lucky Star, or Yunochi from Hidamari Sketch are comparably low-key, and part of Yuno's arc is her journey to discover her own aesthetic out of an admiration for the impressionist output of other creators. Naota from Fully Cooly seems like someone who thinks this way, but is only just coming to even understand himself by the end of the show. This kind of frustration can be seen in Soul Eater as well, who is much more outwardly aesthetically driven, but also hasn't quite nailed down exactly the kind of person that he wants to be yet. Masaomi from Dura Da Da is in a similar position, though he's been put there as much by external forces as by inner conflict. Category 11, Shadow Caretakers. Fairly lateral, 
fairly impressionist. In a similar way to how caretakers seem inclined to assist more lateral and more impressionistic thinkers to organize themselves, shadow caretakers seem driven to do something similar in reverse, offering emotional comfort to more lexical and linear thinkers because they find themselves in the middle of all the extremes. However, while these people may be uniquely predisposed to understanding and knowing how to help others, they don't necessarily have the words to explain their complex impressionistic ideas. These people will most likely develop a powerful sense of defeat over the course of their life at how often they are misunderstood, and will either need to constantly refine their communication to reach people more clearly, or give up and simply choose to explain themselves as little as possible except in contexts where they are made to feel comfortable speaking freely. This guardedness can keep them feeling distant to even the people that they care about the most, and keep them watching those people from the shadows more so than directly interacting. Given that I named this category Shadow Caretakers, a lot of these characters will fit that description very literally, but my patron saint of the category definitely doesn't. She's the loud and boisterous Asuka from Neon Genesis Evangelion. Asuka is an obsessive admirer of the high IQ room brightener Kaji, for whom coolness and charisma are second nature. Asuka thinks similarly to Kaji, but her lexicon for projecting her idea of coolness is vastly more complex. She obsessively customizes her behavior in order to craft a specific character that she considers to represent her innermost intentions about her identity. But to more linear thinking observers who aren't used to the idea of a more chaotically crafted identity, the level of craft put into her performance gives it an appearance of facade. Asuka is smart enough to be aware of this, which is why she's gone out of her way to learn how to justify herself lexically, readily diving into explanations about why her worldview is correct, because she can't tolerate people getting the wrong idea about her impressionistically expressed intentions. What Asuka desires more than anything is just for someone to appreciate the level of effort that she's putting into accomplishing her goals while remaining true to herself, but her trueness to herself isn't appreciated by anyone else, who would prefer that she turn off those abrasive parts of her personality in order to cooperate. What those people don't understand is that the whole of the identity is integral to her ability to perform herself. Asuka can't simply achieve the understanding which allows her to operate with the efficiency that she does without being in the flow state of being true to herself. Evangelion suggests that the shadow caretaker is only in the shadows because that's where society has decided to put them. But the majority of these thinkers will come to this realization early and simply place themselves there, and possibly embrace the role wholeheartedly. Akatsuki from Log Horizon is a great example, an aesthetically obsessed role player who dedicates herself to the service of a loyal master, offering her strength from the shadows. Even though I'd consider her to have a fairly high IQ, her understanding is much more physical than lexical, leading to her enormous feats of strength and weapon arts. Her arc in the first half of the second season is basically about achieving the same kind of flow state that Asuka did at the end of Evangelion. Other characters with similar personalities to Asuka include the likes of Edward Elric from Full Metal Alchemist, Sanji from One Piece, and Gintoki from Gintama. Others with personalities more similar to Akatsuki include Homura from Madoka Magica, Anri from Durarara, Kurama from Yu Yu Hakusho, Sasahara from Genshiken, Reina from Hibike Euphonium, and Lugosi from Beastars. Saori from Wandering Sun starts off as more of an Asuka and basically gets beaten into the shadows by her surroundings. Narako from the Monogatari series goes in the opposite direction in the second season. Ereka from Ereka 7 is probably the closest thing to being in the dead center of the two extremes. Not every character in this category is quite so pronounced, of course. Koizumi from Haruhi seems pretty comfortable in the background, though he indulges himself somewhat in his kind of eccentric manner of expression, putting him on the border of being a room brightener. Hiro from Hidamari Sketch is more than comfortable as a simple art student, playing low-key wife to her quick-witted counterpart. There aren't a lot of popular low-IQ characters in this category, but to be a low-IQ Shadow Guardian is simply to suffer, as evidenced by Subaru from ReZero. This guy has no idea who the hell he's supposed to be or what the fuck he's supposed to do, so he's working hard, ramming his head against every wall in his path until it breaks. Poor bastard. Category 12. Fascinators. Very lateral, fairly impressionist. If you thought being fairly impressionist and fairly lateral made it difficult to connect with and communicate with others, it only gets harder as understandings become more laterally complex and specific. 
The only thing keeping these characters from registering immediately as autistic is that whereas lexical autistic thinkers will attempt to explain themselves with an endless string of words, an impressionist is more likely to keep to themselves and let their actions do the talking. Because their logic is so opaque to outside observers, others tend to develop a certain fascination with characters of this type, for better or worse. Senjo Gahara from Monogatari will have to be the patron saint of this category because she's the one who codified it herself during the first season. It may be tempting to see Hitagi as a more lexical character as she engages endlessly in conversation with Araragi, but this has more to do with Nisi Oisin himself being a hardcore analyst who is obsessed with impressionistic thinkers. After all, Senjo Gahara treats language entirely like a game, bending it to her desire and caring way less about precise meaning than about creating an overall impression. That is, with the one person she actually feels comfortable opening up to at all. Most of the time, she prefers the stone wall approach, with a hardcore aggression policy towards anyone attempting a breach. Characters with hyperlateral minds that can't be understood have a tendency to use it for evil in anime, like with Griffith from Berserk, Gendo from Evangelion, Isaiah from Dura Da Da, or Shar Aznable from Mobile Suit Gundam, all who massively manipulate everyone around them in service of some grand scheme. C2 from Code Geass sits somewhere mysteriously in between. Rei from Sangatsu no Lion would make another good patron saint for this category, as someone whose incredible intelligence manifests itself in his impressionistically hyperlateral understanding of shogi, which earns him comparison to the current reigning champion, who we eventually learn is even more dyslexic in his understanding as a result of being literally deaf. Motoko from Ghost in the Shell is similarly given a sort of power by her hyperlateral understanding of the internet. But what if one of these characters flat out didn't care what others thought of them and just laid out the full breadth of their impressionistic, hyperlateral thinking right out on the surface? That's where you find god dare characters like Haruhi from The Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya or Kyoka from Kyodan Kazoku Nikki, whose confidence in their breadth of lateral understandings leads them to regard themselves as literal gods. Kyoka is more often correct, though Haruhi is extremely intelligent for a high schooler, but if you want to see a lower IQ version of this character, look no further than Isaac from Bakano, whose self-confidence persists in spite of frequent failures, only offset by what seem like inexplicable successes. Perhaps the most relaxed character in this category is Tsumugi from Kaon. Not only does she seem fairly comfortable hanging in the background most of the time, but she manages to make friends who appreciate her even if they can barely understand her. We get to see a lot more of her chaotic thinking in the way that she moves and expresses herself, which isn't usually noticed by the other characters. If there's a fascinator out there I can say is working hard, it's gotta be Tatsuhiro Sato from Welcome to the NHK. This poor dude's mind is a paranoia theater as he haplessly tries to ascribe words to the chaos of his brain, retreating from society in the process. Now that we've reached the end of this column, I hope you've got a fair impression of impressionistic thinking. I think the anime which best represents the clear-sighted archetype would be just about any magical girl show, especially Nanoha and Madoka, and plenty of shonen action stuff for stuff for younger audiences like Naruto, Eureka 7, or Pokemon. Room Brighteners might relate with Konosuba, Dororo, Fuli Kuli, Soul Eater, and Galco. Silent Guardians are perhaps best represented by Beastars and Hibike Euphonium, with great characters in Evangelion and Madoka Magica, Wandering Sun, Genshiken, Yu Yu Hakusho, Hidamari Sketch, and Duda Da Da that you might connect with. Fascinators definitely need Sangatsu no Lion in their lives, will probably relate heavily to Haruhi Suzumiya, and should try out Kyodan Kazuku Nikki. If you think you might be clear sighted, get your anime recommendations from Caribou Kun. If you're more of an out-and-out -out room brightener, you might connect with Man Mode, Demolition D, or Nino. Shadow Guardians will find solidarity with My Japanese Animes and Pantsu Party. And if you're looking for fascination, look into KYDB and Cat Girl Research Society. We're at the final stretch now, so it's time to get real dang impressionistic. Category 13, Pure Instinct. Very linear, very impressionist. If you are always living in the moment, and your understanding of that moment is completely dyslexic, then there's little chance that you're often going to the trouble to stop and recount what's happened to put it into lexical terms for someone else, especially if you're smart enough that your seemingly impulsive decisions prove to be the right ones a lot of the time. Instinctually driven characters and people will always be the most popular, because they are capable of making the right choices in ways that are totally inexplicable to anyone else. They are the least pretentious and easiest characters to project yourselves onto because any lexical reasoning that you apply to their actions is more specific than what has been stated in the text. 
Attempting to understand one of these people is a participatory process, in which others can't help but get involved, as evidenced by the most perfect real-world example, US President Donald Trump. Distinguishing high and low IQ is incredibly difficult with these characters because it's so hard to be sure why they made the decisions that they did. In the end, the safest bet is to look at their rate of success versus failure, and how quickly they learn from their mistakes and change course. While my choice of patron saint is still too young in the story to really flex any kind of intellect, I think Gon from Hunter x Hunter is presented as much more understanding and adaptable than most of the characters in this archetype. He's a lot more likely to actually take that extra second to think things through if he's not completely sure what to do, but when pressed, he'll clock into overdrive and let his instincts run wild. If anyone's been working hard in this category, you know it's everyone's favorite boy Guts from Berserk. I've touched on this archetype previously in my video Interesting Anime Protagonists, but in spite of this trope being fairly common to anime and manga, there aren't a lot of stories which really try to capture the strengths and weaknesses of this manner of thinking in the way that Berserk does. Guts lives an incredibly harsh life from the very beginning, but the strength of his instincts always guides him to the top of physical confrontation, even if he can barely string together a sentence. When considering one of these characters is lower or higher IQ, I think we should consider their adaptability to different situations. Guts is basically useless in any context besides a battlefield, whereas Gon is actually capable of higher learning in addition to instinctual battle prowess. With that in mind, the following list is organized from what I would consider lowest to highest IQ based on the character's failure rate of understanding and decision making. Ryoga from Rama 1 Half, Shiro from Fate Stay Night, Mugen from Samurai Champloo, Goku from Dragon Ball Z, Luffy from One Piece, Space Dandy, Ichisei from Techno Lies, Ahiru from Princess Tutu, Rei from Neon Genesis Evangelion, and Misaka from A Certain Magical Index. Category 14. Impressionists. Fairly linear, very impressionist. Not unlike room brighteners, impressionists tend to have some kind of specific crafted persona which they tend to embody, but these people are even less interested in or capable of explaining themselves, and as a result are a lot more easily misunderstood. Depending on how talkative they are, this might make them come off as mysterious or simply insane to others. The patron saint of Impressionists is the man who flows like water, Spike Spiegel from Cowboy Bebop. While I might not go so far as to call Spike a genius, it's readily apparent that he's always got a much better grasp on the situation than anyone would think, and is extremely quick to adapt, only bested by the sheer chaos that tends to unfold across one of his missions. Like other somewhat non-linear thinkers on the fringes though, his being a thinker makes him a bit of a brooder as well. It's noteworthy, by the way, that after creating this character, Shinichiro Watanabe's next two protagonists were driven by pure instinct. I'd have to say that Revy from Black Lagoon is working pretty hard by comparison. Her constructed character is based on a pretty narrow worldview that she isn't interested in challenging, and she struggles hard with new ideas. Her instincts are great in the heat of battle, and thinking doesn't seem like it has the same amount of value to her in pursuit of survival. Characters I'd put on the more linear side are the likes of Ryuko from Kill La Kill, Shizuo from Do Da Da Da, Ranma from Ranmo and Half, Vash the Stampede from Trigun, Onizuka from Great Teacher Onizuka, and Chitose from Girlish Number, who thinks that she's one of those god dare fascination types and has to learn the hard way that she ain't that. Ritsu from Kaon seems like a bit more of a thinker, but not by much, and certainly not above average IQ. Category 15, Aestheticians. Fairly lateral, very impressionist. Back when we talked about Shadow Guardians, we saw how a laterally constructed aesthetic identity is difficult to communicate to others, in spite of those people being capable of understanding other people in a lot of neighboring categories. Aestheticians, on the other hand, have an even more difficult time communicating with lexical thinkers, and are likely to encounter a lot of difficulty and frustration living in a society which is so driven by lexical codification, when their personal understanding of reality and its rules are not only much more laterally intricate, but more lexically unquantifiable. As a result, these characters tend to be incredibly frustrated with everyone around them, feeling like they are both trying to say the same thing and wondering why the other person is so hung up on word choice. While I can't say that he's the most intelligent character in this category, the undoubted patron saint of aestheticians is Kamina from Gurren Lagann. The core arc of Gurren Lagann can be considered a story about the need to balance lexical and impressionistic thought by showing the strengths and weaknesses of both extremes. 
where Rosiu was a technician who at his worst nearly damns humanity with his lack of imagination and at best leads it to rapid sociological progress, Kamina's imagination is what brought humanity out from underground in the first place, even though his recklessness was eventually the death of him. Kamina wears an intricate and aggressive persona which permeates every aspect of his communication, not unlike Asuka from Evangelion, but he doesn't feel he needs to justify himself lexically in order to deserve to be considered correct, and thus just like her, he sets out to prove himself again and again. He's a bit more mature than Asuka though and fully recognizes his need to rely on more lexical thinkers to get him out of trouble, but because his quick-witted buddy Simon was trapped in a mind prison during Kamina's final battle, he ends up making the wrong impulsive gamble. For a more grounded take on this type of character, take a look at Taiga from Toradora. We actually know from her grades and problem-solving abilities that she's pretty intelligent, but her lingual abilities are sorely lacking, not helped by the fact that the persona she's crafted to face the world with is transparently inauthentic to her real intentions, causing her to contradict herself and mess up constantly until the caretaker Takasu can offer her some acceptance. For a younger and less temperamental character in this category, take Ni Tori from Wandering Sun, whose struggle to understand themselves impressionistically and to reflect that understanding externally is the backbone of the story. The actual higher IQ characters in this category would be the likes of Accelerator from A Certain Magical Index and Toru from Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid. Both of these characters have a very particular understanding of the world's rules which happen to be fundamentally at odds with the understanding of those around them, leading to endless frustration over the fact that they both are pretty sure they know what they're talking about but have no way to communicate it to a hyperlexical thinker like their companions, yet both seem to have been convinced to shift their hyper-specific worldview slowly to better reflect the relationship that they want to have with their companion. Category 16, New Types very lateral, very impressionist. What if you had nothing but just insanely complex, detailed, and robust ideas all the time and absolutely no idea how to express them in words without serious deliberation? From the perspective of pretty much anyone else, you would seem completely incomprehensible. And yet, depending on your intelligence, it might be that you actually understand what's going on in the world around you even more completely than a living computer is capable of. There could be no patron saint of new types but serial experiments Lane herself, the goddess of the wired and literal schizophrenic. Even though she can hardly squeeze out a word when confronted directly, her way of thinking allows her to prevail on the internet, where information exists in endless forms and arrangements. The dichotomy of how she is perceived is common towards these characters, either that of completely writing them off or outright worship. In all honesty though, just as the human calculators are usually typecast as super geniuses with social dysfunction, the most common portrayal of new types is as hyper-social morons whose unique mental capabilities only lead to feats of bizarre genius about as often as lightning strikes the same place. Mako from Kill Lock Kill, Mayuri from Stein's Gate, Yui from Kaon, Index from A Certain Magical Index, Kafka from Sayonara Zetsubo Sensei, and Miria from Bakano all fall under the trope of a hyperlateral thinker spewing what seems like mostly nonsense much of the time, but occasionally stumbling on a long shot grasp but understanding something which no one else in the show could get. Not all of these characters are portrayed as equally idiotic though. Miyako from Hinamari Sketch isn't the brightest, but is a more realistic take on the character type. Mamimi from Fooly Cooly is treated like an idiot by the people around her, but reveals an underlying intelligence that no one understands over the course of the show. Misaki from Welcome to the NHK comes across similarly mysterious, as she keeps most of her real feelings veiled behind a lexical persona. Shiki from Kata no Kyokai is presented as fractured between her lateral and impressionistic minds, leading to an intensely difficult personality to understand. Haku from Spirited Away is a literal god, though not necessarily an especially intelligent one given he is manipulated and taken advantage of by smarter humans. Nia from Gurren Lagann is probably one of the most heroic characters of this type, refusing to be blown off when she isn't understood, and steadfastly staking her claim on her understanding in the same way that Kamina would have, but while being even more intelligent. Anthe from Utena has more of Misaki's approach, where her remarkable and veiled intelligence allows her to manipulate everyone around her in ways that they never even notice while staying quiet. You may have noticed that I've only talked about women so far, and that's because these characters are way more commonly female in anime than male, for reasons we talked about at the start of the Impressionist section. In spite of the fact that Japan is a nation with a masterful culture of Impressionist art, their society puts so much stock in lexical thought that more sensitive or egotistical boys will struggle to be identified in their culture, whereas women with those personalities will just simply be written off as borderline or insane. 
Shinji from Evangelion is probably the best male example in the category, as well as the most realistic portrayal of this neurotype in anime, and I'm sure it's got a lot to do with what's made him one of the most contentious anime characters of all time. For the more wacky genius variety of new type, you can look to Eiji Nizuma from Bakuman, who basically draws manga on pure instinct following his hyperlateral thought process. Jing from King of Bandits Jing probably falls into this category as well, though we never really get much of a peek inside of his head, and though the same can be said of Sakamoto from Haven't You Heard I'm Sakamoto, it's clear that his high IQ new type problem solving skills are the backbone of the series. And with that we finally completed the last column. Pure instinct thinking is probably best reflected in wacky adventure stories like Bo 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 Bo, One Piece, and Dragon Ball. Impressionists and aestheticians will definitely want to check out the works of Shinichiro Watanabe, such as Cowboy Bebop, Samurai Champloo, and Space Dandy, and Hiroyuki Imaishi's works such as Dead Leaves, Gurren Lagann, Panty and Stocking, Kill La Kill, and Promare, as well as anything directed by Masaaki Yuasa, Fooly Cooly, and Soul Eater. New types will owe it to themselves to be familiar with Serial Experiments Lane, Neon Genesis Evangelion, and Revolutionary Girl Utena. Instinctual thinkers are not as likely as most to get a lot out of analytical content since their thinking is more impressionistic in the first place, but that doesn't mean that you can't have any options. Check out my brother Vic from Vic and Hope or Munchie and Hypocrite on the Chibi Bacchus podcast for more esthetician takes on anime, and follow Zen Huxtable or Gil Lies here if you want the pure new type action blasting into your eyeballs. So everyone, did you learn something about yourself watching this video? Which category do you think best describes you? Remember, this is all a spectrum, so everyone will probably find themselves somewhere in between a couple of categories, but leaning more to one side. Can you think of any other anime characters that you'd like to classify into these categories? Let me know in the comments, and write out your justifications if you want to have a conversation about it. Are there any categories that you think need to be more clearly defined, or do you have suggestions for better names for categories? Let me know. This is basically my life's work at this point, so I might as well keep refining it. And of course, have fun making every single person in your life place themselves on my fucking neuropathy chart and turning it into the cultural institution that you know in your heart it deserves to be. Certainly more than MBTI. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to my channel, donate to my PayPal, buy things with my Amazon link, listen to my music, read my goddamn light novel before the physical release Kickstarter comes out, and as always, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.